Hi everyone. Uh, I haven't made a video in a very long time, I realize, uh, but I haven't really known what to do. And I got a question uh, the other day from someone who wanted me to make a video again on the Celtic Cross. And I, they wanted me to list 10 tips uh, for going about it. And I started writing some ideas down. I only came up with five that I think are particularly important, you know, and since this is a spread that a lot of people use, I thought it wouldn't hurt to do another video on the Celtic Cross. I know a lot of people uh, seem to like the first video I did on the Celtic Cross. Some kind of mixed opinions lately about that video and that technique, but it's something that I'm going to stand by and kind of reiterate a little bit in this video. Um, I think the first important thing when you're doing a Celtic cross, this, this the person who asked this question uses the taut deck, and I agree that you know in my experience, particularly at first using the taut deck, I found using it for the Celtic cross to be a little problematic, and I think it was problematic more because of the the nature of the pips, the the minors, not having pictures really on them. Uh, in, a, in a Marseille kind of fashion, they're a little tough to pull information from when you are reading them as uh, in a positional sense, as you do with the Celtic Cross. You know, it, it, it's tough to look at, I don't know, something like the Three of Cups, which is kind of just ambiguous pleasure and happy society. It's tough to look at something like that in... I'm not sure, maybe uh, the, the, the root position. It's tough to say exactly what kind of pleasure that is that could be the basis of this situation. Is it just general pleasure? And is the person, you know, um, just focusing in general on pleasure? Or is it a specific pleasure that is the basis of this? Is it the formation of a relationship? Or did the person just have a successful date? You know, like... There are a lot of different ways of interpreting that single Three of Cups, and without having a picture, it it can be a little, uh, it can be a little problematic for your intuition. I I found it at first tough to get my intuition going with with things like that, and so that's really how the the resonance technique was born. Um, I wanted a way of generating information from these kind of silent cards in a way, uh, particularly the pips, uh, the, these sort of silent cards, I wanted to try to get more info out of them and, and see how they were related to each other and see if their relationships with each other could tell me more about them as individuals. And in my experience, the, the resonance technique has been very effective uh, for reading for myself, for others, uh, it, and I find it the most effective into the, the most effective technique that I can come up with that harmonizes the need for, or at least my personal need for intellectual uh, or philosophical explanation for why something means what it means and an intuitive um, situational kind of uh, reasoning for why something means what it means. I think resonance helps us sort of bridge the gap between those two things and come up with a reading that is both aware of the, the historical ramifications of things, but also the intuitive subcontent. So before uh, I suppose the first thing that I would suggest is, is really and truly do things one card at a time. Uh, I know that that seems, or could seem like, kind of like a beginner kind of thing to do, but I do that all the time myself still, and I think it's a good way to start a Celtic cross reading. You know, I, I usually lay them all out. I don't lay them out one at a time and talk about them because uh, that just doesn't work for me. And I don't think that in total isolation you can really get a lot out of them, especially with the top deck. Um, I prefer laying them all out, flipping them all over at the same time and whatnot. And just going through and saying, you know, if I'm working with a client, I like to say, uh, this is your, this is covering you 
and this card generally means blah 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 so put together we could say that your overall situation is yada 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 okay and go through each of those cards and, and same thing if you're doing the reading for yourself just go through each card in its position and think about how they go together and think about them separately don't don't force yourself into merging them right away I think you wanna you want to have a very clear idea of what each card means to you in the positions that they've turned up in okay I would do that first and then once you have that if you're if you're still kinda stuck and if it's just not coming then what I like to do is get an overall feel for the reading um, how does the reading make you feel basically it, it, it's it's pretty simple actually you know you just look at the the cards and I do it mostly by color color tends to to work a lot and particularly with the tot deck because the tot deck is so uh, symbolic in terms of its color choices in its in its images and so I think it's important it, it, it can be very effective to look at the tot in terms of uh, how it represents manifested energy. You know what colors are what colors are being presented to you in the reading. If a, if a reading is very muted and has a lot of grays and dark blues and blacks and you know these sort of muddy colors, you you can feel the emotional content of that. That has a very visceral response. Uh, or or um, effect on you. If a reading is full of bright, you know, fiery colors and yellows and reds and stuff, you know, you can say that the person is a very ambitious uh, person in this situation, or uh, is is being very active and is working really hard lately on a on a certain project, is really passionate about what they do, it, and etc. You know, use. Uh, use what you know about color symbolism. If you if you really want to go even further with it, you know you could say blue is the color of communication and is associated sometimes with mercury and speech and whatnot. And so therefore, if there's a lot of blue in a reading, you can say you know the the client is or querent is in a lot of communication with people. And then you can maybe ask them or yourself if you're doing it for yourself. Um, in what way are you communicating and how is that communication affecting this situation either positively or negatively okay uh, that's definitely something that I love to do just to get a general first impression of uh, of the reading as a whole you know you sort of want to know the components first and then look at it as a whole structure because you can't really understand the whole thing if you don't understand the subcomponents okay it's sort of like uh, knowing how a machine works. You know, if you really want to use a machine properly, if you really want to be an engineer of a machine uh, and use it to its fullest effect, you have to know the parts of the machine and how they work and why they work the way they do. So you have to know, uh, you have to do all that, you know, single card, one thing at a time, relating it to its position first, and thinking about its attributes too. You know, with the taught, you have to think about your planetary uh, significance, your elemental significance, and your, your zodiacal uh, attributes. All of that stuff is very important for determining the frequency of a reading, the, the, the overall feel of it. It's very important. Uh, then I wrote uh, the difference of energy between card types. I think this is also something that can be very helpful is noting the difference between the different types of cards um, and the different energies that those bring. A major arcana card is going to, or major arcanum for the singular, is going to be a lot more powerful and have a much larger effect than, you know, the two of wands, than a minor arcana. It just is. And so it's important to sort of grade the the level of importance of certain cards and uh, the level of effect. Now this is something that we do in the opening of the key spread very naturally. With the with the Celtic cross, we sort of have to go back to basics and and come up with a different way of determining uh, level of effectiveness. And I think that is definitely determined by um, the strength of its significances as far as how much they resonate with other things and whatnot. Um, but also just the basic 
card type? You know, is it a major? Is it a minor? Is it a court? What kind of court card is it? Is it a knight or is it a princess? You know, and what do those mean? What kind of significance does that have in a reading? Uh, does that mean that there are people involved, or is that just the, the querent going through various psychological transformations in this situation, or, act, or responding to different aspects of the situation in different ways, you know, with different personalities, so to speak? So it all depends. And some of this is, I think, the beauty of tarot is that you, unless you are a psychic, I th and I, even if you are a, a very powerful psychic, I think communication is very important with, with doing a reading with someone. You want to uh, not be afraid to ask them questions and try to get them to think about these different significances. And the same thing with yourself. Reflect upon what the, the implications of these of different subtle aspects are, you know, because otherwise you're just going to get a narrative and it's going to be very basic and it isn't going to give you very um, profound information. It's sort of just going to tell you what's up and what's coming your way. And I think tarot is a lot more powerful than that. I think being able to understand the why allows you to act more uh, in a more empowered way in the situation. Okay, so that's but but that's another thing you know in determining your overall narrative structure. Think about the the strength of cards, you know, based on type. Uh, the other thing is uh, you can also use the Tree of Life for guidance if you're if you're confused about positions and stuff. Uh, I was thinking recently about the Celtic Cross and and how it possibly came about. And I was thinking how, you know, how obvious the the connection between the Celtic Cross and the Sephiroth is when you simply consider the fact that they're both based on the number 10. You know, the resonance, again, between the Celtic Cross and the Sephiroth uh, is pretty strong. And if you go through each position, it isn't too hard to see how the, the numbers associated with, uh, or rather, the positions of the Celtic cross can be sort of loosely placed on the tree of life, and and I I do say loosely, you know, it's not uh, they're not perfect fits, but some of them work really well, and uh, and and it can sort of help you to kind of understand the interrelationship between certain ideas and whatnot, uh, if that helps, and just sometimes you know to really try to figure out how a card relates to its position. You know, um, I can't think of a, of a good example right now, but, uh, and, and I, I usually go, uh, just to clarify this, I usually go in the order, because um, I know everyone does the Celtic Cross in different orders, but I do the cover card, crossing card, crown, root, past, uh, incoming, future, and then I, of, of course, go up the side. Uh, so in that case, we would have Keta corresponds to one, Hulkma to the cross, Bina to the crown, which I think works actually pretty well, um, and Chesed as, as the, the root, and this really just, Chesed as, as the idea of the Demiurgos, uh, the, the Lord of the Manifested Universe, no, the, number, the root position is, of course, that which has uh, transpired, that the Querent has made their own. Uh, it's sort of the foundational aspect of the situation that has brought it about. Uh, and so that does work with Chesed quite a bit. The past would be Gaborah, that which fades away, that which is waning, that works very well. The one that doesn't quite work so well, but still sort of makes sense, is the immediate future for Tifidet. I think of Tifidet as the sun being born, that which is continually coming into manifestation, um, and so the immediate future sort of has loose connections to that idea. Uh, Netzach, for your personal opinion on the situation, that sort of works out. Uh, Hod, for uh, your environmental aspects or your house, uh, I think it's important to remember that uh, Mercury or Hod is associated with the path of Bet, and Bet means a house. 
which could be just coincidence, but I think it's kind of interesting. And hod is, of course, associated with form and being clothed in form. So it, it sort of works, you know. And just to finish it up, yesod for hopes and fears. Yesod is such a dualistic sephirah. It's, it's very much two things at the same time, and the fluctuation between those two things, the current of that, uh, of, of the, between that polarity is sort of the, uh, the gears of the universe, uh, so to speak. And, and hopes and fears are such a psychological thing, you know, it really does work well with the Esod. And then last but not least, the overall outcome, number 10, uh, is based on, or is supposed to be evaluated based on all the cards that have come before it. And what works better than that, uh, to represent that, than the Sefer of Malkut, which is the culmination and full fruition of everything that's come before it. So, it, loosely enough, it can work. If that's something that appeals to you, pulling from the Sephiroth for a uh, pos deeper positional meaning, go for it. I mean, it's something that I've started to, to try to use in my technique, and it's it's there's certainly nothing wrong with it. So you can definitely go ahead and do that. Um, and then last but not least, I think, my last point, uh, is just returning to the the basics of the idea of resonance in the first place. And the theory behind resonance um, is that any two things that are like uh, resonate with each other. They share a commonality, and therefore they're part of kind of a, a, a category. They're part of a, a family of sorts. So, for instance, the Six of Swords is Mercury rule, uh, ruling Aquarius, and uh, let's say you've got that in a spread with the... Um, it's another Mercury card. The the Three of Cups, to return to the Three of Cups, which is Mercury ruling Cancer. Even though those two cards technically, on the surface, have nothing in common, they both have a mercurial element to them. And so, despite being totally different elements, or even being in totally separate positions on the, tree, uh, on the, the Celtic Cross, we would say that those two cards share a similarity with each other, and therefore their meanings affect each other. Uh, they have a relationship with each other. Uh, you could also do the same thing for a, all the court cards in the reading, all the majors, all the minors. You know, do they? Are there any patterns that you see? Are there any similarities? Are there patterns of elements? You know, what are, what do all the elements have in common? Uh, in other words, what do all the fire cards in the spread have to do with? Are there no water cards in the spread? Why do you think that is? Uh, just pull at information like that and ask questions based on what's there and what isn't there and, and how that affects the makeup of the situation. Because you can't really, again, you cannot advise someone effectively on a situation if you do not understand the components of the situation. And it is very much a scientific thing what you're doing with the Celtic Cross or with any spread. You are dissecting a situation into its various components and energies and evaluating its makeup so that you can put it back together in a different form. That's the basis of all science. Or at least as Alistair Crowley defined science. Um, and I think he's he's pretty accurate in that. Uh, so so that's definitely a, a good way of doing it. Uh, and, and to connect meanings with each other. To connect uh, ideas. And I think the, the other thing you can do with this too is uh, if you find pictures in the reading itself, uh, and this is something where I really should have a visual example of, but I don't at the moment. Uh, if you have, I don't know, if you have in the, 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 uh, the horizontal part of the cross, if you have all earth cards and going down the vertical line is all air cards, you could say that your internal life is in great conflict with your material life, because your material life is very much mundane, focused on money, focused on practical matters. On the outside, you are just a very practical person, but on the inside, you could be very much a mental person and very stressed about things or trying to think about things very logically. And so there's there could be considered a, a disconnect between your external and your internal column. And it, that could manifest itself in different ways in the relationship. That could be one of the bases of the, the, the problem itself. You know, 
uh, if you have even, let's say you have um, kind of like a cup of water cards in the past, the root, and the immediate future, and then there are no other water cards until the hopes and fears section or something like that. You could say maybe something like um, you are uh, just a very... That's not a good example. I, I was, but let's say uh, instead of having the full cup, you had water in the. Um, this is a simple example in the past and not in the present or the future, and you had it also in your hopes and fears. Then you could very easily say that pleasure is something that is on someone's mind, perhaps in a nostalgic way, you could then ask, you know, what are you, what are you nostalgic about? What are you missing? What are you longing for? And how is that affecting your mental state and your ability to function? It just various things like this. And I, I'm a, a strong proponent of doing sort of like Rorschach with this, you know, whatever pictures you see based on these patterns, look for pictures, look for literal pictures. If it looks like um, a mountain of fire cards, you know, in the spread based on positions, then say something about it. What does that say to you? And how does that re respond to the situation? If you see um, a lot of water cards, but they're all very sp spread out, what does that mean? Does that mean the person is drowning in their emotions or their emotions are really scattered and they're not really sure how to connect them all? You know, if you see a cluster of swords, does that mean the person is really high stressed, you know, very, um, under a lot of pressure, uh, or is being, or or their mental activities are being suppressed by someone else, or you know, like there are a lot of ways of of picking apart uh, the Celtic cross. So I I hope that this this was helpful. I didn't come up with ten tips, but I did come, try to come up with five. And I do recommend uh, if you're interested in my theory of resonance, uh, watch the first video I ever made, the how to do the Celtic cross scientifically. Um, there's that, and, uh, and yeah, uh, let me know if you have any other questions, and I, I hope it helps. I know it's tough, uh, and I hope you liked it, and thanks. Bye.